be on YouTube, just to let you know. Okay, great. Well, um, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is a bunch of books, HIV AIDS Traces in the Center for Book Arts Collections, um, a virtual talk with 2022 Book Art Research Fellow Yuji Kawasima. My name is Jillian Lee. Um, I'm librarian at Center for Book Arts, and um, I had the pleasure with working, of working alongside Yuji uh, in 2022. Um, I want to say a few words about our presenter. Um, Yuji Kawasima has a PhD in art history from Universidad Complutense de Madrid. His work as a researcher, teacher, and curator focuses on practices related to gender and queer studies in the Latin American context. He collaborated as a researcher in the artist Leo Nelson's critical catalog, authored academic articles and essays for the artist catalogs in the US and Europe, and is working on a book on Leo Nelson. Previously, he was in charge of coordinating postgraduate programs at the Museo Reina Sofia's study center and he's been teaching at ESNE in Madrid and has developed curatorial and educational projects at Museo Reina Sofia, Sao Paulo Outbrook Art Book Fair, and Centro de Arte dos de Mayo, among others. Yuji was one of two 2022 Book Art Research Fellows at Center for Book Arts. Um, the Book Art Research Fellowship was initiated in 2020 as a way to fund and encourage academic scholarship in the book arts and using the Center for Book Arts collections. The Book Art Research Fellowship and this program are generously supported by the Pine Tree Foundation of New York. Thank you all again for coming and um, I'll let Yuji begin. Thank you, Yuji. Thank you. I'll share firstly my presentation. A second, please. Yes. I can do it. Uh, yeah. Can you see this, Gideon? Yes. Okay. So thank you, Gideon, for the presentation. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this online session. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Center for Book Arts for this opportunity, Corina Reynolds, Camilo Otero, and especially Gillian Lee. Uh, your friendly guidance was essential to this experience and this personal journey that was this residency at, at CBA's collection. Thank you. Uh, no less important is my profound thanks to Camilo again and to Eva Parra, dear and generous friends who always made me feel at home when I'm by their side. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all, all of you. So let's start the story. It was September 6, 2022. There, there were only two days since my arrival in New York from Madrid. So, yeah. The exhaustion due to the long trip and the six hours difference between the two cities was no more significant than the excitement of being New York again at last. For over two years, I have wanted to come back to the city that inspires me so much and where I always find something that makes me want to return or even not leave. But our plans had been paralyzed by the COVID pandemic, something that now seems to be lagging, but that paraphrasing the motto of the fight against AIDS, it's something that definitely is not over. But perhaps it would not be necessary to recall the changes and tragedies that suddenly dominated us all at the beginning of 2020. But it was impossible for me not to reconnect from many points of view with the sensations of the previous two years of the morning of September 6, 2022. Two years in which I had moved considerably away from academic research. Years in which the professional uncertainties caused by the pandemic and, and the melancholy, melancholy sorry, of not finding meaning in almost any effort crossed me. Shortly before this, I had finished a thesis in art history focus on Giuseppe Newsom, 
a largely renowned Brazilian artist who died from complications related to AIDS in 1993. This research made me think about car archives, collections, and libraries of artists like him, how we preserve their memories, and what kind of narratives we produce with the stories of those who tra whose trajectories were influenced by the AIDS crisis. For this reason, when I arrived at the Center for Book Arts on my first day as a researcher uh, in residence, and Gillian handed me a first box full of documents, not only did I find a first sample of the corpus of, the of this research, but I was reacquainted with who I could be. Although I was encapsulated in the characteristic solitude of the academic research, as I could see afterwards, by a photo silent take, silently taken by Eva, I found myself again accom accompanied by many lives that had been, lives that could continue to be. Because everyone has heard this story. During the peak of the HIV AIDS crisis in different cities worldwide, the frightening rate of death cases could be tracked by the skyrocketing number of times one bumped into a bunch of books lying on the streets or for sale in thrift stores. There, on the third floor of 28 West 27th Street, I saw myself sur sur surrounded by a bunch of books. Within the silence of the long hours of research, sometimes I could hear some voices, such as Claudia Wonders, a Brazilian transgender artist pioneer activists for LGBTQAI rights and people living with HIV who passed away in 2010. She said, AIDS, more than, a, more than an epidemic, was an archive, was an archive elimination, sorry. AIDS, AIDS killed knowledge being created by the queer communities, left-wing people and marginal artists. Suddenly, there was a void, end of quote. This sensation is shared with a small format publication that I found in the first days of research, in which cover its author decided to pin a folded red ribbon, Hazardous Ways by Louis Netherland, published in 1996. Reading the phrases accompanying the illustrations, much of them based on a, a, a aerial photograph of the AIDS Memorial quilt, quilt on public display, give us an objective scale of the crisis. I invited you to read them together. In 1992, the World Health Organization found that one in every two, 250 adults in the world was infected with HIV, the virus that leads to AIDS. Each day, 5,000 people are newly infected. Three quarters of these acquire the, the virus through heterosexual intercourse. Countries with, with the most people with AIDS, US, Brazil, France, Spain, Italy, Sudan, Zaire, Tanzania, Malawi. Two million people already have AIDS, and more than 10 million people, men, women, and children carry the AIDS virus. Have we become immune to suffering and a stranger to compassion, even as this play claims the lives of men, men, women, and children in ever increasing numbers throughout the world? What is the price? Sorry. No. Yeah. What is the price of such immunity? Can we, as individuals and as nations, afford it? Do you know? Do you care? Where will it end? I started thinking about the body as a deleted file through Claudia Wonder's quote and Louise Netherland's work. The body as the carrier of a biography, the body as a library in a bibliography. Not only were countless lives lost, 
but so were books in archives. Equally, plans for imagined publications, drafts for awaited texts, and sketches for future projects came to a sudden halt. An enormous body of knowledge, desires, and practices that instead of being the main topic of vast volumes, sometimes remain as discrete notes on the margin of a page. But to my surprise, what I found in that first box Gillian handed me wasn't precisely scarcity or a void. This must be what I call the specific intelligent, intelligence, the magical power of librarians, I thought to myself, when what I mistakenly thought would be very unlikely to find in those folders began to emerge. To this day, I can't help but suspect that Gillian somehow knew exactly what they was doing when they handed me the first boss saying, I think you should check this out. I had made a pre previous list of volumes directly uh, related to the topic I was looking for. In other words, publications and books by artists that in some way made visible the impact of the HIV AIDS crisis in, uh, on the CBA collection. When I arrived, many of these re requested materials were already separated, but without premeditating, I was in front of that box whose existence I was unaware of before the day. Inside it, an endless variety of documents. Why should I check this out, I wondered. It was the first box of the five that make up the archives of Richard Minsky, founder of the center, which had been recently proce processed and cataloged. A few weeks after the end of my stay at the center, I noticed that a button appeared on the CBA website where I could read. New, Richard Minsky Collection Finding Aid. By clicking it, one could have access to a detailed description of the material that I had consulted. Photographic materials, in print, negatives, and slide formats of people, staff, apprentices, apprentices artists, students, event, art, event attendees, events, workshops, exhibitions, artwork, and the Center for Book Art Exterior and Interior Spaces, video, video footage of events, with records and ephemera documenting benefits auctions, administrative documents, events and education materials, exhibitions, catalogs, press releases, advertisement cards, broadside, mailing pieces, pamphlets, courts and workshop shadows, and other ephemeral promoting exhibition, special events and education programming, press clippings, small collection center individual orders, and select center for book art publications. In that first box, the documents were mostly dated at the beginning of the 70s when AIDS epidemic was far from becoming a historical fact. But yes, Gillian knew what he was doing. As soon as I opened each of the folders, putting aside the materials that I had consciously requested, the possibility of reviewing the history of this institution itself was also opened. I was crossed by the opportunity of restoring the experimental spirit and affective bounds that sustained that, that specific community. And from there, and only from there, I could identify the traces of the impact of this epidemic in those collections. It became clear to me that it was not enough to replicate the canonical discourse surround, surrounding art histories, art history during the AIDS pandemic, forcibly adapting it to that specific collection. Delving to those five linear fates of institu institutional history made me see that I had to pay attention to the uniqueness of those documents and the singularity of the stories they were telling me. And that indeed, I was the one who did not know anything about what I was doing. And for this reason, by being immersed in those uh, CBA collections, I felt compelled to start collecting as well, to collect traces, vestiges, anecdotes, conjectures, and all sorts of things that inevitably challenge the regime of authority on which the great history of art is built. 
MINUSCO in fragmentary materials that depend on a vulnerable and subjective narrative that gives them meaning. Because only in this way can this material generate memory, materials that denied my initial suspicion, suspicion sorry, and ended up being abandoned. By being selected, endowed with meanings, they helped me to craft the brief story I'm trying to tell you now. Looking for more information about one of the authors previously identified in my, pro in my project, Barton Lidice Benish, or Benish, I found a kind of endorsement for this methodological approach in one of his books. Benish is one of the most prominent figures in the history of the CBA. Many of you may be familiar with his works that are part of CBA collections, such as the censored book, yeah, yeah, and letters from my aunt Evelyn. He was included in many of the center activities since its foundation. And also he was a first generation veteran on, of the AIDS crisis and chronicled his own HIV positive status in Lethal Weapons, a series of works created with his own blood that generated media and political uproar when it was displayed in different European cities in, in the 1990s. In any case, I became interested in one of his catalogs in the CBA library named Curiosa, which brings together a vital journey project, a vital journey, a vital pro project by Benes. He was not a simple artist. He brilliant, brilliantly acted as a collector, an archivist, an art historian when he built a private museum a cabinet of curiosity in his own apartment in New York, in which he gathered tiny memorabilia of famous people and important events. From a piece of Elizabeth Taylor's shoe to a crumb from the wedding cake of the Princess of Prince Wales of Wales. But also a pink tape from act up actions or the cotton used to wipe fluid from his partner's nose before his death in 1989 due to the AIDS-related illnesses. The artist himself confirms that AIDS was a structural factor in his work. He explains, I quote, because of, way, because of AIDS, there is a strong element of remembrance in my work. We all have things that only we know are relics. A slip of paper with a lover's phone number, the ticket to a movie we've kept for years, or a handkerchief with a scent of perfume. Left to history, these objects fall by the wayside. We all have a drawer full of them. But when my friends died and families often they hadn't seen for years would come to collect their things, they invariably threw the contents of the drawers into the waste basket. I started to get there before then, before everything was lost. And as friends and gradually strangers saw what I was doing, they began to send me the relics as a way of putting them in the bank. My apartment has become a safe deposit box, a vault of memories." End of quote. I thought how lucky I was to get close to this author's artistic sensibility. Living through those pages, I felt authorized to continue trusting in my methodological strategy. I just had to activate this gaze that I was borrowing for, from Barton. Instead of fabricating an artificially closed story, I just had to look at what tends to be overlooked and could potentially have ended up in the wasted basket or just being jumped on the street or forgotten in the back of a thrift store. I only had to look at the documents, materials, and archives that precisely from their queerness give us clues about the experiences, knowledge, and practices of these corporalities and artistic trajectories that are so rebel. After all, if we often have the impression that there is no consolidated historical account of these marginalized experiences, it's not because a proper archive has not been produced yet. 
The archives that do exist reflect the nature of the very body that makes them. They are scattered, blurred, and usually misinterpret, mis misinterpreted. Misinter How can I say this? Sorry, misinterpreted. Sorry, I think you understood me. Um, misinterpreted, yes. These are files that requ require more flexible criteria and evaluation parameters. They are files that demand unusual interpretation for, from those who investigate them, as Binet proves while dealing with the object of affection of his deceased friends. One must learn to see the world differently, always. If AIDS blew up the conventional categories that sustained the artistic accounts disseminated by museums, could my research depend only on the strictly, strictly visible, objectual, factual matter of books? Shouldn't I open it up to other forms of archives? Wouldn't this be the only way to get closer to the fleeting, volatile, perishable nature of the experiences I wanted to address? As fleeting, volatile, and perishable as a copy of the postcard created from the works of Brian Buczak preserved by the CBA. Printed in 1987 by Purgatory Pie Press, we see a can of paint pouring over a blue globe on the left, and on the right, a skeleton figure. Buczak passed away the same year from HIV AIDS related complications and the postcard sale revenues went to people with AIDS coalition. Another act of presence of these artists in the collection is the book edited by his then partner, the Fluxus artist Geoff Geoffrey Hendricks. Together, they founded a small artist press called Money for Food and worked together on multiple art projects. The publication is devoted to some of these collaborations, titled Four Hands Examining the Color of a Thought. Near the end, after a long sequence of images of these works, the reader may come across a brief writing by, Lo by Lawrence Weiner, a close friend of the duo. On that discrete page, Weiner creates a memorial to Brian Buczak in his own way, a decade after his death. He says, that's so little sweet, Brian. He had heard that not only was art, sorry, he had heard that not only was art not an activity and alienated from life, but there was a good chance that art was alive. He then, in company with his mate, set about upon the adventure, adventure, money for food, art as a celebration of survival. The bad news was that all seemed to hang upon the collection of loose ends. The good news was, the was that Brian was not a tidy person and here and there are left behind the traces, the remains, and the sense that death so little suits those that live. Weiner concludes the text with the exact words he had install installed in the, in the 80s on the facade of Brian in Geoffrey, New York residence, which also served as money for food press headquarters. Water is spilled, is spilled from source to use. Here again, I was reminded of the importance of paying attention to what is left behind, the traces and remains, to what disorganizes the tidiness of conventional historical discourses, to what is supposedly missing simply because it's not there. That is exactly what I spotted when I opened another of Gillian's suggested boxes and found the series of stickers created by Jenny Hauser titled Messages. Inside a plastic envelope, different sets of four stickers printed in 1988 with some of the phrases that are bound in the creative trajectory of Hauser, also a renowned ad advocate in campaigns dedicated to education, treatment, prevention, and the stigmatization of HIV AIDS. What I could have been a lucky discovery, another one for a list of accomplished research goals, brought me a feeling of disquiet. 
that set of stickers didn't present itself as a neatly preserved piece of art. It was charred with life and its mysteries. That was what I felt when reviewing set by set, I noticed that in the last one, one of the stickers has no, was no longer in its original place. Once again, I found myself with another of these voids, these gaps that populate this research. The artist James, the artist James, James Press had probably used the missing sticker before he donated it to the CBA collection alongside a selection of his and other artists' works. Who used it wasn't the main question. The phrase printed on that lost sticker was the so famous protect me from what I want. I concluded by comparing the sets I had in my hand with the description of other copies being sold at online auctions at mind blowing prices. My question were, well, my questions were, where did this one sticker end up? What does this blank space mean? For a moment, I was so overwhelmed by all the possibilities to be considered, I preferred to imagine that this phrase, this sticker, had been metamorphosed into the condoms the Hauser produced in those same years, massively distributed in, and being used throughout the whole city, omnipresent. As omnipresent as when anyone could read the same phrase at the top of an electronic bill billboard in 1985. A phrase conceived to encourage the thinking process about the consumerism design within the capitalist veracity, as some art historians say. A phrase to that other walkers in, in Times Square would inevitably find different meanings. Impossible not to imagine an artist like David Bojnarovic looking up at that billboard in Babs in that area so well known to him as he narrates in seven miles, seven miles per second, a graphic novel produced by Wojnarowicz in collaboration with James Romberger that we can find at CBA library. It is easy to imagine, uh, it's easy to imagine him there because as David himself said, or said in one of his tape diaries, my feeling is that imagination is the key a phrase later appropriated by Hauser, by the way. One can only imagine how, fo how photographs like these ones ended up in the Richard Minsky archive. They are photos of the exhibition named Your House in Mine, Your House, Your House is Mine, a project conceived by Nadia Cohen and Andrew Castrucci in 1988 in, in which uh, different artists and cultural agents created posters in response to the heated climate around housing, homelessness, gentrification, and the AIDS epidemic in New York City. There we see a drawing by David Wojnarowicz. Uh, here. But also that by Martin Wong. Also, a young artist based on the Lower East Side whose life and work were directly influenced by the AIDS crisis, uh, AIDS crisis sorry, and who is increasingly the subject of a necessary historic, historical recuperation. We can also identify the graphic creation by Vince Gagliostro and Avram Finkenstein. Gagliostro was an original member of ACT UP and Finkenstein, co-founder of Grand Fury, the design collective that was the propaganda arm of ACTA. Had these photos been taken in an exhibition produced by the CBA? Not really. They were probably taken at Bullet Space, a community center founded in the winter of 1985. But although we do not know the provenance of these ima images very well, the curious thing was to observe that decade, decades later, these posters did come to be ex exhibited at the CBA as part of the Silence Unbound exhibition created by Heather Allison Power in 2014. A showing 
a show in which, by the way, the public was also able to see the first time in the CBA gallery some pieces by Jenny Holzer. What is missing always re reappears somehow. At some point, it stopped seeming like a, mere co a coincidence that I found other supposed empty spaces to be filled in. There was another lost image. In a photo album from the first years of the CBA, I saw instructors, apprentices, mach machines, tools, and techniques portrayed in black and white images from an open house session during the 1977 uh, Christmas. My eye went directly to the blank space on the page. There were marks of glue removed from the, removed from the paper. Only the handwritten text in black paint remained. Apprentice Reg Walker demonstrates sewing books on raised cords. In an email sent to me on September 13, 2022, Mr. Minsky told me, Reggie Walker was a gay black apprentice in the mid 1970s with two beautiful dogs who died of AIDS in the late 1980s. He was almost single-handedly single responsible for the resurgence of Coptic bookbinding. He asked me about the history of bookbinding in Africa, and I took him to see and handle the Ethiopian manuscripts in the libraries of Columbia and Princeton, two of the best collections, with examples dating back some 1,500 years." End of quote. In the early 70s, Walker worked at the New York Public Library, where he had the opportunity to catalog rare books and works on paper. In 78, he was awarded sorry, a National Endowment for the Arts Master Craftsman Educational Grant through the Center for Book Arts. As mentioned, this allowed him to study ancient Coptic book forms for his artwork. Despite this camp documentation we have about, that we have about him in the archives, nothing prevents us from imagining him every Saturday, during, every Saturday during the winter of 1978 at 1 p.m. working as an instructor of French binding technique in the former headquarters of the CBA, located in the number 15 of the Blicker Street, Street, as we can check on the list courses offered by the center. But we can also imagine him as an artist displaying his unique creations based on ancient Egypto-Ethiopian and Celtic book graphics, graphics sorry, in exhibitions such as the commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the CBA, which took place in 1984. The current exhibition at CBA created by Megan and Liberty, crafty and conceptual art reshaping the legacy of artist book also includes some of his pieces and illuminates the trajectory of this still elusive figure. Why is the trajectory of this artist is still so unknown? Although he contributed so much to the book art, being so well connected with prominent figures of his time, such as his, uh, two of his friends who also died prematurely during those hard years, for example, the photographer uh, Peter Ujar and the art star Keith Haring. Shortly after this, this first contact with the CBA's photo album, Gillian sent to me a photograph of Reggie Walker. They told me Megan recently found it during her curatorial research. It makes all sense to think that this is the, the lost photo. There, we finally see Reggie. There he is, under the watchful eyes of his apprentices. However, I can't stop thinking that we still don't see him. Perhaps because he's very focused on his work. Perhaps because the camera does not capture his face from the front. But maybe because, as we know very well, most analog films until very recently didn't favor skin tones such as Walker's and their chromatic calibration. That may be why I get so emotional whenever I look at Ujar's portrait, portrait of Reggie Walker. 
Here we have him again. Here we have him completely, I would say. Vince Aletti, his former flatmate, described uh, Walker as, I quote, funny, quick, and intense and had great style. I don't remember that pistol pendant he's wearing. It seems so unlike him, but he always wore a cap, end of quote. The Ujjar talent and sensitivity highlight Haraji's undeniable style and beauty. But, but what really amazes me are Walker's eyes. Although the pistol pendant operates as the optical center of the frame, this gaze or his gaze is the gravitational point of the portrait. His open eyes look outside the frame. Somehow they seduce me as a spectator inviting me to guess what an artist like him is looking at when he looks into an empty space at something that is not there. John Eric Brodus is another creator who is in own way played brilliantly with the camera as well as with this empty space in his art. This book artist, costume performance artist and painter who lived in New York is somehow always looking at us. He looks at us in his signature stamped faces, his many self-portraits, photographs, and his graphic art. Here, we see him in a catalog of his elaborate one-of-a-kind outfits, consisting of beaded and pent splatter capes, jewels, artfully crafted paper feathers, and elaborate hats as defined by Robert Hyde in, in a profile published in the 99th, in the 99th Springs edition of Book Art Review. Hyde continues his, his description. An artful and in an aristocrat manner, he knew just how to engage an admirer as well as put down an enemy who might be questioning or wondering how it was the creature before then had so strayed from the norm, end of quote. Eric Brodus' creations are impossible to define microcons, microcons. Just as these artists could transform a grocery store, a gallery opening, or a nightclub with his mere presence, he also turned his books into theatrical stages, otherworldly spaces, and flamboyantly queer utopias. But he meticulously constructed spaces through chromatic games, geometries, and cutouts made with a scalpel. The technique is intricate and results in areas absent of matter that, on the contrary, are only sometimes empty, as we see in this work exhibited at the CBA in 1988 in the Outer Space Exhibition or like here in his book, Echoes, which can redefine our conception of emptiness, absence, and what is not here. The, these voids produced by his uh, cutouts are ultimate fertile spaces. They allow escape in the tour, in which our eyes as readers can find rest in another dimension, in layers of existence beyond the physical limits of the paper itself, discovering sometimes, uh, discovering something we didn't even know we were looking for. It is what the artist suggests in one of his latest projects, the catalog of his exhibition at the CBA in 1990, it's being 1-2 books, paintings, a memorabilia by John Eric Rogers. He says, in particle physics, spin 1-2 is a term used to describe the discovery that reality has to spin one way and back the other way in order to be fully experienced. Therefore, a second look is always advisable. Mr. Minsky recalls that John Eric Brodus was in the hospital during the preparation of this show. 
in the, in the documentary John Eric Rogers, the book of survival, survival, sorry. One of John Eric's friends says that although he was fragile due, the, due to the age-related illnesses, the artist was determined to defy his doctor recommendations and attend the opening. He says, John Eric was in a wheelchair surrounded by his own art, surrounded by his beautiful things, end of quote. And I can imagine it, surrounded by his bunch of beautiful books. Although there, there has not yet been a specific exhibition at the CBA on this subject that I'm trying to develop here, I think it is essential to mention exhibitions such as Geometry and New Math, 1996. It was the first exhibition that recognized the book's potential influence in defining a person's gender identity and sexual expression in practices as well, exploring the diversity of contemporary sexual experience and current attitudes toward human physicality, male-female relations, homosexuality, AIDS and desire, as the curator Brian Hannon explains in the catalog. The show included, for example, for example pieces like Properties of Sin by Guy R. Binning, which cover uh, was stamped with a crucial issue concerning sex, the phrase, wear condoms. A Sex Guide for Girls by Judith Hibikoff was covered in latex. Need I say more? It's author provoked. Poetry by Richard Bright, Love and Other Four Letter Words, published by Richard Smith, was a book inspired by sexual encounters, reminiscence, and wishes, a collection of condoclad poems with a spermatozoid decorated background. In 1994, an anthropomorphic book by the same curator included pieces created by Ivan Monforte, Ivan Monforte, sorry, a former CBA artist, in a, a former CBA resident and an HIV prevention educator. Title story, it is a hand, handset letterpress in pressure pink print of a pair of men's white cotton briefs with the word sorry printed over the crotch. The show also presented Daniel J. Martinez works of Cines, published in association with AIDS Commemorative Day Without Art, as well as Louise Netherland Hazardaways. Martinez's piece, piece includes, includes two dozen wraps in packet red, green, and blue condoms with the words intimacy and truth printed on them. More recent curatorial projects such as Artist Book as, as Subcultures, 2009, Cancelled, Alternative Manifestation and Productive Failures, 2012, Require Reading, Printed Material as Agent of Intervention, 2012, Silence, Unbound, The Artist Lexicon, The Making, 2014, and Querying the Biblio Object, 2016, Help to trace a possible genealogy of events that in some way propose debates that have some affinities with this research. In this exhibition, in, in these exhibitions, the audience could get close to works made by General Idea, for example, Group Material, Dave Wojnarovic, Carlos Mota, and Gary Hayes, among others. Sadly, in this presentation, I would not have time to delve into these exhibitions and other artists that are part of CBA's collections. I just wanted to mention briefly, for example, Mark Odson Smith, who creates a book uh, titled Years Yet Yesterday, based on 2004's Larry, Larry Kramer's speech, Tragedy of Today's Gaze, in which Kramer's, uh, Kramer declared, we have lost the war against eight, as a form of a call to action for members of the gay community to an unite in action, safety and speech. Also, how can we not mention Norman Shapiro, whose prolific studies on gay pornography do not stop giving us clues about the changes in the practices in forms of representation of desire 
in recent decades. Or how not to mention Gerard Chakier, whose books full of triangular shapes are inspired by the graphic art produced by aid support groups. How can we not remember that Chariot was Reggie Walker's teacher from 66 to 71 in Chicago, and that, and that, it, and that he, he was the one who lent the Walker's works for, for Coptic and collage, ancient technique, modern application, an exhibit, sorry, an exhibition organized by the CBA in 1997. Everything that I have told here, everything that I have not told here, could be summed up in such a generous email from Mr. Minsky, whom I, whom I also thank for his kind words. I quote, the CBA was always attracted LGBTQIA people, and of course that meant HIV was a daily presence, whether it was an activist printing or another heartbreak. It's natural that those out of the mainstream find companionship in books, a history of people similar to themselves and seek to express themselves in our medium." End of quote. When I read these lines for the first time, I was at the desk Gillian had reserved for me. Books and documents, boxes and folders surrounded me, but also the machines and tools Furniture, furniture and spaces where much of what I have narrated here had occurred. I thought the past I was studying was impregnated on those papers, preserved in the drawers where the types are kept, in the metallic surface of the tools used, used by generations of book artists. The sound of someone working on the machines gave me a strange sensation of listening to the past. But at the same time, a sensation of being inside my own current obje object of study. And immediately, I also felt I was inside the sentence of the Mr. Minsky email, of Mr. Minsky email. After all, probably without knowing it, he was not speaking only about the past. He also spoke about my present, about me, a person that finds companionship in books, a history of people similar to myself. I looked outside, outside the frame, perhaps as Walker did in front of Ujjar Lens, towards the window where I saw the CBA flag. It was September 13, 2022. And somehow the emptiness was not there anymore. And I no longer felt so alone. Thank you. Wow, Yuji, thank you so, so much for that presentation. Um, I personally am feeling very moved and very grateful for you telling us that wonderful story. Um, thank you. Do you have time to take any questions that might be in the audience? Yeah. Sure. Is there a question? If I'm anybody here to... has any questions yeah. that came up during the during this presentation, um, now is a great time. Yeah, or comments or suggestions. Everything is welcome. Oh, Megan is here. Maybe she can, I don't know if the, the exhibition is still uh, uh, in, in, the, in the gallery, maybe yeah, we can actually, talk about a, it. I, I haven't had the opportunity to, to visit the exhibition when I was there. So yeah, I have maybe we pictures. can Crafting talk something Art about this opened, if she wants. Do you want to hop on? Um, Crafting Conceptual Art opened in mid-January and um, there is one of the works by Barton Benish um, is the letters from Aunt Evelyn. That's in the Central Gallery. Um, there's Megan. Hi, Megan. <laughs> nice to see you here. Hi, nice to meet you after all our emailing. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, it was a great presentation. I was so happy to see you talk about Reginald Walker and, and Barton Benish and so many artists that um, I was also looking into. So thank you so much for your research. Thank you. Thank you for sharing information as well. And I, I'm really curious to see some images of your exhibition because it's true that for me, I don't know if you have the same experience. It was really difficult, especially in the case of Reggie Walker to find uh, information in the uh, span of time I was in New York. I, I didn't have the opportunity to check uh, the documents that are in the New York Public Library. Uh, so it's something that I would like to do someday, but I think that for those who are watching us and maybe are interested in, in, in this artist, I think uh, uh, is a task that we should do together to recuperate uh, his trajectory, I think, uh, alongside with other names that may emerge from my presentation or uh, other people who are studying maybe the same topic through the archives of the CBA collections, I don't know. Yeah, Reginald Walker's papers are at the Schomburg, so you're, you're able to yeah. um, make an appointment and go view them for anybody who's interested. Uh, and they have quite a lot actually about his, oh wow, Karina's uh, Karina pulling up the exhibition. the Central Gallery. <laughs> Thank you, the Reginald Walker work, wow. Karina, the Reginald Walker work is by the front door if you wanna show that one at all. Oh yeah, there's the Benish work. Yeah. So it looks amazing to see it um, in person and the towel is actually stained a bit and shows um, some weathering, which I think is nice uh, and speaks mm -hmm. to the kind of poetic interpretation of the work that you were talking about in your presentation. Nice. Yeah, and there's Reginald Walker's work. It's very fragile, but uh, it's really beautiful. They are not from the CBA's collection, right? No. No, it was actually loaned okay. by Gerard, as you said, the same work ah, that was okay. in the Coptic okay. show. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, impressive. Yeah, it's really fragile, but very beautiful. Uh, and you can see all the hand stamping. And if you visit his archives at the Schomburg, you can see he was making keys to kind of um, research ancient Greek and Roman lettering. So all of this mm -hmm. text that we see actually does have um, meaning that he was trying to interpret and express through this ancient writing system. Uh, there's research mm -hmm. on where he sourced all of his different stamps uh, and all of the different symbols in it. Uh, research about hand paper making as well. So he was also making this paper by hand. Yeah. Wow. I hope you'll be able to come back to New York and see it. Yeah. Until when the, the exhibition will be open? It's in New York until I'm sure somebody at CBA can say the exact date, mid March, late March. Okay. Yeah. And then it travels to San Francisco and Minneapolis. Oh, Maybe you'll be able to catch it in one of those other places. Also, I saw that uh, there is some Ulysses Carrion works on your exhibition, right? Uh, I was yeah. I, I I was checking. Uh, I saw some documents related to other books and so and Ulysses mm -hmm. Carrion in the CBA's collection. I was studying the possibility of including uh, Ulysses Carrion uh, in this presentation, but I didn't find any like consistent documentation of the relationship between uh, Ulysses Carrion and CBAs, but I, I, I was There's also some to see what you have brought to the exhibition. Yeah, if you're able to visit CBA's archives at Columbia, they also have some more correspondence mm -hmm. uh, between mm -hmm. um, Barton Benish and uh, Minsky, yeah. and that talks yeah. about Barton's uh, relationship with Ulysses Carrion. He actually went to Amsterdam to visit other books and so. Yeah, I, I saw these letters, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then I think there's a few more in the Columbia archives, which has some of Center for Book Arts institutional archives as well. Uh, and then in the catalog mm -hmm. for this exhibition, there's some reproduced material that you probably saw in CBA's archives of um, Ulysses Carrion and, and Richard Minsky corresponding. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And then here you can actually see the photo that you were talking about of Reginald Walker, 
we found the yeah. original and put it in the show. And then the contact sheet, and I believe. where was this? Jillian, do you remember where we found it? It was just in the boxes. It was in, it was in an archives box unlabeled with 20 other photographs from that decade. It was, yeah, wait, go, it was Karina, a, it was a real just book yet. that I found it. Yeah. And then the contact sheet that Karina just showed you below you, G, it mm-hmm. has more images of Walker where he actually turns to oh, face wow. the camera. And I was just talking to Karina about this the other day that I wonder where the, the negatives are from this. So I would love to get some more of these blown up because it looks like it was selected. It is circled, but the uh-huh. the images where he's facing the camera weren't where we couldn't find the enlarged versions of them. So it is again, these absences yeah. you're talking about these voids that are still left yeah. by, by this history. Yeah. 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 I, I was really moved when I, when I was checking the photos, the album, of these uh, CBA open house sessions. And it's true that uh, it's really, there is some emotional impact to see that blank space. I know, I know and- that I, I, I don't want to be really emotional, but it's, it's so charged with historical meaning when you see mm-hmm. that this is the only one photo that was not there. And I don't know if you know why it was not there uh, if it was used to other kind of uh, printed material or whatever but the sensation the physical sensation sensation is was really uh, significant to me so that's why i decided to make some comments on my presentation about it uh, and compared to the peter ujar portrait uh you i i, I would yeah i i have some kind of a sensation of poetic justice, maybe, uh, to this figure. I don't know. I'm glad you showed that and that you made that point because I felt the same way when I was going through the the scrapbook and I found that to be the only one um, missing from the album as well. I felt a very similar emotional feeling about it, especially because I was also looking for him and looking for traces of him. And then to see that he was the only one absent, I felt just like you did. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and also I found on the internet, it was not so difficult to find a photo uh, taken by Peter Ujar of uh, one of his dogs. <laughs> yeah, I saw one that of the, uh, Yeah, <laughs> uh, Richard Minsky told me, uh, well, he mentioned uh, the two dogs uh, Reg Walker had, so I found really uh, moving as well to see the dog uh, being uh, portrayed by P- Peter Ujar. But of course, the Peter uh, the Reggie Walker to see his face and and his uh, not only the facial feature but his presence was really important to me in in this process of crafting this text. I think beautiful. Um, are there any other questions from anybody else who saw the presentation today? Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Karina, for showing the um, pieces that are up right now. Okay, well, um, if anybody has any questions about the collections materials that were shown today, feel free to email me at collections at centerforbookarts.org. Um, Thank you again to Yuji for your wonderful presentation and your hard work on crafting this beautiful story and all the research that you did over those weeks at Center for Book Arts. Um, It was wonderful to work with you. I'm so thrilled by this presentation you just gave. I'm really inspired. Um, If anybody here today is a scholar or knows any, the applications for the 2023 Book Art Research Fellowship are open and I encourage you to apply or share the application widely. Um, and again, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you to all for coming. Thank you, Gillian, Corina, and, and all the CBA team. I'm really happy with the results of this. I, if you think it's uh, a good thing, we could share some of the results of the, of these uh, research. Maybe I was thinking about like making a list of 
publications or, or uh, files that I that I was revising. Maybe if someone wants to continue yeah. from what I stopped, it could be also. I think it's a good consequence of my of this work we have done uh, in September. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really happy uh, with the with this experience, and I recommend you to apply if you want, if you can, to this <laughs> residency. <laughs> And I miss a lot you and in you and, and Center for Book Arts people. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. 